Uh, the last we met, we read in Judges chapter 11 about the newest judge, Iftak, Jephthah in English, who lived in a place called Gilead. Now, Gilead was on the east side of the Jordan River. And he had been driven out of his family home because he was an illegitimate son of his father, Gilead. And Gilead's legitimate sons did not want their inheritance to be jeopardized by having to give an equal portion of it, perhaps, to Jephthah. Even more, Iftak, again, that's Jephthah, all right, his mother was a prostitute. So this made Iftak a social outcast. And Gideon's sons didn't want such a degrading association within their immediate family. So Iftak had gone off and created a gang of desert pirates who raided caravans and, and villages and generally hired themselves out as mercenaries to, to rich men and to minor potentates in order to make a living. Now, as unsavory as all that might seem to us, such a profession was not terribly looked down upon in those days as it would have been in more modern times in the, in the Western world. Jephthah would have been viewed as a misbehaving brother more than a despicable, immoral thug. And as could be seen with the earlier story in the book of Judges of the self-appointed king Avimelech and the man who would depose him, Gaal, the creation of these band, bands of bandits were pretty usual and they weren't at all universally rejected. In fact, a certain kind of admiration akin to that given to Robin Hood was more the attitude within Middle Eastern cultures. Well, the leading men of Gilead regarded Jephthah as a brave and cunning military leader. So when the king of Ammon declared war upon the territory of Gilead, these leading men of the village realized they had no qualified field general to lead their militia. So they sought out Iftak. Now a contingent of elders from Gilead, some of them from among Iftak's own family, imagine the irony of that, came to Iftak, hat in hand, and offered him a job. Now obviously there would have, would have had to have been something substantial in it for Jephthah if he was going to risk his life to fight for the very people who had despised him and ran him off. And that something substantial was their guarantee he would become the leader over all of Gilead. The agreement was sealed with a covenant and an oath spoken at the Israelite army headquarters at Mitzpah. Now before we read more of Judges chapter 11, I want to also remind you of the parallel that I drew last week between the cause of this conflict between the king of Ammon and Israel versus the modern conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The king of Ammon said that he wanted the land that had belonged to the Amorite, uh, rather Ammonites returned to him. And if Israel would do that peacefully, there would be no conflict. The problem is that Ammon never in history held the land that they wanted Israel to give to them, the land of Gilead. And when we look at a map, we see that Ammon proper lay to the east of the territory that Israel now held on Jordan, on the Jordan River's east bank. And when Israel was on its exodus journey, hundreds of years earlier, from Egypt to Canaan. It was a powerful tribal nation called the Amorites, not Ammonites, Amorites, who ruled over that area that would eventually be called Gilead, as well as the area that the tribe of Manasseh would control. It was the Amorites who attacked Israel and were defeated. 
and Israel recognized Ammon's territorial rights and so generally left it alone. But again, Ammon was located much further to the east, so it wasn't involved in the conflict between the Amorites and Israel. Now, apparently, some Ammonites had lived in the area that was now Gilead, and the king of Ammon was using that as an excuse to declare that Israel had no right to the land they had held since their exodus from G Egypt, which had occurred over 300 years earlier. Bottom line, Ammon was making a bogus claim for the land of Gilead. Ammon had never in history occupied or ruled over that area of Gilead. Well, when Ephtok heard that this was their demand, he just firmly rebuffed the king of Ammon, told him that his, 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 his historical facts were just an error, and he had no intention of giving up that land to Ammon. Now, in our time, we see this same thing happening with the Palestinians in Israel. The Palestinians manufacturing a bogus claim and then demanding Israel to comply or they're going to cause never-ending conflict. Now, because it's so important, I want to state again for the record, prior to 1967, yes, our 1967, not B.C., okay, there was never a people called the Palestinians. Nor was there ever a nation of the Palestinians anywhere, let alone Israel. The Palestinians are simply expatriates of various Arab nations who came to Israel after Israel was reborn as most of them, most of them, after Israel was reborn as a nation in 1948, to find work. But when the Arab League attacked Israel with their mighty combined armies, these Arab workers fled to Jordan en masse, expecting to return home to their choice of any former Jewish house that they wanted. That was the promise made to them. Israel beat back their attackers, and of course, we're not about to allow these Arab workers who were loyal to the Arab League right back into Israel again. And the Arab nations from which these workers came, they refused, this is key, they refused to let these Arab peasants return to their own home nations. So now they're what? Refugees. Pretty dirty trick, huh? The strategy was to use these displaced Arabs as pawns to achieve the Arab League's political demands that Israel be turned over to the Arabs and rid of Jews. Suddenly, these so-called Palestinians are overnight an ancient people group who had been expelled from their land that's now occupied by those terrible Jews. And the Jews are bad guys. The media is complicit in this great lie. And the Western nations of the world, including the USA, are so interested in maintaining a good enough relationship with the Muslim world so that the flow of Middle Eastern oil continues and the constant threats of Islamic terrorism against us might subside, are often willing to sacrifice Israel to the Palestinians as a peace offering. The main difference in how this matter was handled between the time of the judges and now is, Jephthah told the king of Ammon his demand was ludicrous. In fact, the king was a liar. Israel wasn't going to give up one square inch of Gilead to make peace. Today, most leaders of Israel are simply spineless politicians. Yes, I said of Israel. Spineless politicians. They want to maintain their jobs. They want to be appreciated and accepted by the West. So they see only compromise and appeasement as the correct path. So the question among many modern Israeli leaders is not whether to give up Israeli land to the Palestinians, it's only which part of Israel's land and how much. 
and what kind of hollow promises for peace and how much goodwill they'll get from the Western world in return. Turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. Uh, we're going to start at verse 29, so if you have a complete Jewish Bible, that'll be page 285. 285. I'm going to start at verse 29 and read to the end. Then the spirit of Adonai came upon Ephtach, and he passed through Gilead and Manisha, on through Mitzpah of Gilead, and from there over to the people of Ammon. Ephtach made a vow to Adonai. If you will hand the people of Ammon over to me, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon will belong to Adonai. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. So he taught, crossed over to fight the people of Ammon, and Adonai handed them over to him, and he killed them from Aroer until you reach Minit, 20 cities, all the way to Avel Kramim. It was a massacre. So the people of Ammon were defeated before the people of Israel. And as Iftak was returning to his house in Mitzpah, his daughter came dancing out to meet him with tambourines. She was his only child. He had no other son or daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Oh no, my daughter, you're breaking my heart. Why must you be the cause of such pain to me? I made a vow to Adonai. I cannot go back on my word. She said to him, Father, you made a vow to Adonai, so do whatever you said you would do to me, because Adonai did take vengeance on your enemies, the people of Ammon. And then she said to her father, just do this one thing for me. Let me be alone for two months. I'll go away into the mountains with my friends and mourn, because I will die without getting married. You may go, he answered. And he sent her away for two months. She left, she and her friends, and mourned in the mountains, that she would die unmarried. After two months, she returned to her father, and he did with her what he had vowed. She had remained a virgin. So it became a law in Israel that the women of Israel would go every year for four days to lament the daughter of Ephtak from Gilead. <clears throat> the first words of verse 29 say that it was only at this point, after Ephtok had been chosen to lead Israel's military, actually their militia, and after this diplomatic con confrontation with the king of Ammon, that the Lord moved and anointed Jephthah as a shofet, a judge. So we see the phrase that, then the spirit of Adonai came upon Ephtok. In Hebrew it says, the Ruach of Yehoveh Hayah Iftak. Now, back in our study of Judges chapter 3, we discussed this, that this concept of the Spirit of God covering or anointing or coming upon a man, in this case a judge, was generally expressed using one or the other of two different Hebrew words, Lavesh or Hayah. And these two words represented substan substantially different ways in which the Spirit of the Lord acted upon a human being. Lavesh meant to clothe a person in the Holy Spirit, like you would put on a garment, an overcoat, in such a way that the person took on a certain amount of divine power that enabled them to do miraculous deeds or maybe gain superhuman strength or insight. Here in Judges 11, it is the word haya that is used, and it indicates that Jehovah's Spirit overcomes a man in such a way that the man becomes especially obedient to the Lord, or that the Lord's will operates in that man in a way that almost replaces that man's own will. So Iftak was operating very much, very strongly in the Lord's will, yet as we will see, obviously not entirely. Now the first thing Ephtok did was to travel through the land of Gilead and the tribal territory of Manasseh. This was half 
of the Manasseh that was in the Transjordan. The other half was on the west side of the Jordan. And added to the size <coughs> of the Israelite militia in order to prepare for this coming battle with the forces of Ammon. And once he did that, he acted in a way that has perplexed and bothered Jews and Christians for centuries. In his anticipation of going to war, Ephtok made a vow to the God of Israel, a very rash vow that was going to cause him the greatest pain. It is this vow that forms one of the most infamous stories in the Bible and therefore is usually the focus of, the, of any study of Judges chapter 11. Now we're going to dissect it pretty carefully, although in some ways I'm not sure how deserving of our time or attention it actually is, or even how theologically significant it is. There is so much controversy about it that it's not possible for me to address it head on. The issue is that to seek God's favor, Jephthah vows to... Jehovah to offer as a sacrifice the first thing that walks out his door to greet him as he returns home from battle with Ammon. This is assuming an Israelite victory. And the reason for the vow was Ephtok's recognition of the need for divine intervention because indeed this was going to be a holy war. So in verse 34 we read, that Jephthah was victorious, he arrives home, his daughter came out the door to greet him, and Jephthah was devastated because he felt he could not go back on his vow to God, since God had indeed given Israel victory. So he felt that he was stuck carrying through his promise to Jehovah. Ephtah saw a direct connection between his vow and the complete victory of Israel over Ammon. Now, whether there was such a real connection or not, his ancient oriental, oriental mind assumed as much. His daughter made it clear that she understood her father had no choice. And in a selfless gesture told him he should do to her exactly what it is he vowed. We're told in verse 39 that after a two-month reprieve, her father followed through with his promise to God. Now, of all the issues these passages bring up, the one that causes the most controversy is whether or not Jephthah actually made a human sacrifice of his daughter, or whether he did something else with her that did not involve her death. And that is what we're going to explore. First of all, we have to set the stage if we're going to do more than just use our own sensibilities and our own opinions and various denominational doctrines, quite frankly, as the unequivocal and rigid answer to this dilemma. So let's start with the nature of the vow itself, as stated in verse 31. The usual English rendering of the original Hebrew is that Ephtok vows to God that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me will be offered to Adonai as a burnt offering. The first key word of this sentence is whatever. Whatever is a poor translation that reflects a predisposition of the translator to what he thinks was in Jephthah's mind when Jephthah made that vow. The Hebrew word is a share. It decidedly does not mean whatever or whatsoever. It means who, which, or that. This is pretty important because by slightly altering the meaning of the word asher to whatever, it means that anything that comes out of the door first upon Ephtok's triumphant return home will be sacrificed. It could be an animal, it could be a human. But if we correctly translate Asher as whoever or whichever, then it points towards that offer of sacrifice being a human. The only question being, which human? Obviously the word what refers to an it, not a she or a he. And the word who refers to a person. 
we don't call people it, we don't call animals who. Well, maybe we do now, I don't know. In other words, it has become a rather standard Christian apologetic to explain that when Jephthah made that vow to the Lord, what he, had innocent, what he innocently had in his mind is that some kind of an animal would be the first thing out of his door to greet him, and so he would use that as an animal to sacrifice to God. But in addition to the fact that using the term asher refers to a person and not an animal, is that even if it was referring to an animal, it still has its problems. The problem is that clean and unclean animals mingled, and they lived together in and around Hebrew households. Dogs and chickens live side by side with sheep and goats and cattle. Now what's more likely when the master returns home? That a dog would run out to greet him or that a cow would? Go ahead, think about that for a little while now. I know this is a tough one. Some answer this problem by saying that a very, in a very real sense, Eftok was turning the matter over to Yehovah. So it would be God's will and prerogative to determine what it is that would come through the door to greet Jephthah, and so become that divine sacrifice. Essentially, it would be God doing the choosing of the sacrificial object. However, because the word asher is employed, almost certainly no animal, clean or unclean, was being contemplated by Jephthah. The ancient rabbis say that probably it was a household slave, maybe a servant, that Eftok was envisioning. Indeed, in ancient times, it was the standard protocol for the chief house servant to race to the master when he approached, to be the first one to greet him because one of the things he would do is wash the dust off of his feet and then give him food and drink. That was his job, and to fail at that could mean severe punishment because it was considered a great insult not to offer the master that kind of respect. Well, another key word is in the translation concerning the words burnt offering. That is, that Jephthah said that who or whichever came out of his door he would offer to God as a burnt offering. In fact, the Hebrew word used is Ola. And we have extensively studied just what Ola is. So I'm not going to go deeply into it today. You can go back and study the Torah class lessons on the book of Leviticus to gain a little more in-depth understanding on the several very specific categories of sacrifices to the Lord, among which the chief one is Ola. While it's generally correct to define the Ola as a bird offering, in fact it doesn't necessarily mean the burning up of a sacrifice. It more means a near offering. The, the Ola is an offering of a gift to the Lord in order to make yourself or maybe somebody else acceptable to the Lord. It's a kind of sacrifice that allows you or another to be declared sufficiently holy to come near to God. And in, pardon me, in general, this kind of sacrifice is of animals, scripturally well defined, ritually clean animals. And the Ola is presented to God by means of it being burned up on the altar. The point is that the nature of Jephthah's offering to God was that it was to be a kind of offering, that it was a gift to God for the purpose of making a person or a nation acceptable to God. Whether it was actually burned up on an altar after it was offered wasn't technically a requirement for an Olah. I want to say it again. The word used in this passage of Judges is Ola, so the offer of Jephthah is of a very specific, culturally well understood, specific kind of sacrifice, not just some general offer to give something to God. Okay? We're going to get back to that now. Just keep that in your minds. I want to be very clear at this point. Despite any teaching you may have heard from your pastor or rabbi on this subject to the effect that it's simply not possible 
given all the circumstances that Jephthah made a human sacrifice out of his own daughter, there is not a single commentary on this subject ever found, ever written prior to the Middle Ages that propounds any other outcome that indeed Iftat made a human blood sacrifice of his child. Not one. The Middle Ages were an approximately thousand year period that began about 500 AD, ended about 1500 AD. It was not until after 500 AD that any Bible commentator, Christian or Jew, theorized that Jephthah did not actually sacrifice his daughter. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it is highly suspicious in and of itself. I'm going to frame this so you get the picture. Imagine the history and the most significant events of World War II being recorded, which of course is what happened. I think we'd all feel that what was recorded during the actual war and then what was recorded within a very short time period after those events would represent the most accurate portrayal of what happened, why it happened, what people then thought about it, what the consequences were, and so on. Maybe within a decade or two, some new pieces of information might be added to our understanding. Yeah, that's possible. But only to a degree, only on the margins. Now imagine that in the year 2000, 2018 now, 68 years, uh, not right, 60 years more, almost 70 now, I guess like 70 or more, Someone writes a book, completely redefines the cause of the war, challenges the first-hand accounts of certain significant events, replaces the thoughts of the participants in that war with their own, and modifies the whole chain of events. See, we have a word for that today, a phrase. It's called rewriting history. And most people with good common sense would have a pretty healthy skepticism that a person who wasn't even alive at the time of World War II would, more than a half century later, refute the accounts of thousands of individuals from all walks of life who lived the World War II nightmare and wrote it down as it happened. Now further imagine if 300 years passed and another person wrote a book that said that some of the original accounts of World War II were bogus. And his understanding of what actually happened, that's the correct one. How would you approach that book? If you're like me, I'm not even sure I'd read it. Because it challenges credulity that a person who lived three centuries after World War II, a person who was completely disconnected by time and culture would somehow have a better idea of what happened and why it happened than the people who lived during it. But now what would you do if 2,000 years after World War II somebody came along and said they have the real truth about it? And it's entirely different than what anybody else has ever stated about that war. Well, that's what we have here with Jephthah and the matter of his daughter. From the time of the actual event and for the next couple of thousand years, everyone from the author of the book of Judges to the eyewitnesses to those who handed down the story from generation to generation to commentators who wrote about it from ancient times, Jewish and Gentile, all agree that the account is literal and Jethah killed his daughter. But it's only after two millennia passes that some rabbis and some Christians decide something different happened than what's plainly stated in the text. And therefore, has up to this point been uni universally recognized as truth. For me, it's pretty difficult to take new theories very seriously, especially when the era of agenda-driven theologies has come pretty well established since the era of the Middle Ages. However, I think it's only appropriate to carry the study a little bit further 
and show you what it is about these biblical passages that has caused some commentators to believe that Jeff God did not actually sacrifice his daughter. There are two main arguments against Jephthah actually sacrificing his child. First is an implication in the wording of the actual scriptural passage, and second is the doctrinal view that God would not permit this to happen. And then allow Ephtah to be considered a hero in later books of the Bible. Depending on your specific English translation, Judges 11, 37-40 says that when Ephtah's unnamed daughter, by the way, understood that she was the subject of the sacrificial offering of her father's vow, her piousness was so great, she voluntarily agreed to accept the consequence. But first she asked if she could have two months to go away and mourn because she was going to die without getting married. Jephthah agrees, and then we're told that after two months she returns, her father did to her what he had vowed, so she had remained a virgin. Further, it says that Israel established a yearly remembrance of this poor girl, during which time the women of Israel would lament the daughter of Ephtah. All right, the key word for this issue is actually virginity. Beginning sometime after 500 AD, some commentators decided that this word was code for meaning her sacrifice was not being killed. That wasn't part of the deal. Rather, it was just her agreeing to be unmarried and so remaining a virgin for her entire life as a fulfillment of her father's vow to Jehovah. Later yet, it was decided that she became a worker at the tabernacle and that any female tabernacle worker had to be a virgin. The logic was that indeed that this was a great sacrifice because it was considered a terrible thing for a woman of that culture and era to not produce children because that was her main duty in life. And since the text clearly states that this girl was Jephthah's only child, he didn't even have any sons, that whether she was killed or whether she simply remained a virgin, Jephthah would effectively have no heirs. So his family line would end at his death, or at best upon his daughter's death. And this was the cause of his great distress as expressed in verse 35 when he cried out, Oh no, my daughter, you're breaking my heart. Why must you be the cause of such pain to me? I made a vow to Adonai, I can't go back on my word. So, here are the main reasons used to defend their position by those who believed the girl was not killed to fulfill her father's vow. First of all, Jephthah knew the law of Moses and, and that it prohibited human sacrifice, so he wouldn't have done it or even contemplated it. Second of all, Jephthah's name appears in Hebrew 11.32 on a short list of great people of faith. How could somebody who committed human sacrifice be included on that list? Third, Ephtah had been anointed with the Spirit of God. No one under Holy Spirit guidance could commit such a terrible thing as a human sacrifice. Fourth, there is evidence that there was an order of full-time women workers in the tabernacle and that indeed they were virgins. Fifth, that we should read into Jephthah's vow to God that if what came through Yiftah's door was an animal, it would become a burnt offering, but if it was a human being, that the human would be some kind of a vow offering to God by means of their permanent service to God. Sixth, when verse 40 says that every year the women of Israel would go to lament Ephtah's daughter for four days, in fact, the word lament's a bad translation. It should be changed to praise her. They went to praise her. I can't deny that some or all of the above is possible. But except for the last point, every other argument is completely subjective. They are people's assumptions. They are their own postulations based on their own morality. The only objectively valid point is the sixth one, where they claim that the word lament 
is an erroneous translation, and they're right, it is. The Hebrew word is tana, and tana in no way means to lament. What it means is to recount, to retell a story again and again. In fact, in later eras, before the Bible was fully written down, there was a group of people called tanas, whose job it was to memorize the traditions in addition to what was written down so that they could go retell it accurately to others. They were essentially to be a human library. By translators incorrectly inserting the word lament here, the obvious intent is to make the story of Eftok's daughter a very sad tale of a girl's death. Instead, say those who believe it was merely the girl's perpetual virginity that was at issue, the word should be praise, praising her for her faith to the Lord. But that is also erroneous. But it, again, tries to characterize the nature of the story retelling uh, to one of, one of admiration, to one of praise, instead of grief, lament. But the word tana which is actually what's here, is quite neutral. It doesn't have any characterization of the nature of the story. It's only the retelling of it. So strictly from that point of view, it's by no means evidence that the girl was killed, nor is it evidence she was left alive. So in the end, I guess it's up to you. I will tell you that while I fi fall on the side of the girl becoming a human sacrifice, I'm not completely closed to the possibility that she simply lived out her life as a virgin. Now let me offer a couple of other thoughts on this, and I, and I hope we can move on. I have no doubt. Jeff would never have imagined his own daughter would any, be, any way be involved in this. He may have been the leader of a gang, but the reasoned way he conducted himself with the elders of Gilead who wanted his help, and the way he sought no real revenge on his family. He approached the enemy king of Ammon in a very thoughtful way without just rushing into battle. He shows himself to be very concerned that Jehovah was with him. All of this indicates that he was pretty rough, but he was no ignorant thug by nature. Yeah, he made a rash vow. I want to ask you. You don't have to shake your heads either way. Haven't we at all at one time or another, when we are deeply concerned over something, made a promise to God that we either really had no control over to keep or one which we thought a little bit better of later? So that hardly means that he was a rash person. Those who argue that the book of Hebrews wouldn't make Jephthah out as a hero if he did such a dastardly, ungodly thing as murdering his own daughter need to consider the great place that King David holds in Bible literature. This is said to be a man after God's own heart. This is a man who promised was promised the throne of the kingdom of God forever and it would be accomplished through Messiah. Yet he committed adultery, murder, fornication, had multiple wives, put the Ark of the Covenant in his personal tent in hopes of gaining personal benefit and a lot more. The Lord will show mercy to whom he will show mercy. The Lord will choose to use whomever he chooses. How we feel about it how we judge the criteria of his choice is completely irrelevant to the Father. We need to exercise great care in using our personal doctrines based on our cultural mores when trying to determine when or if a Bible character merits either the scorn or the admiration that's assigned to him or her by the Holy Scripture. Jephthah was a very flawed man. 
operating like all the other Hebrews in that time who were so terribly compromised by evil. He had mixed pagan practices with the Torah, came to all sorts of conclusions about what was proper worship and proper sacrifice that were way off the mark. And yet God used him just as he was for kingdom purposes. Everything Iftak did was not good. Everything Iftak did was not in obedience to the Ruach, the Spirit of God. But some things were, such as the life of a believer. We will fail far more than we'll follow God's will, as we ought to do. Yet that does not mean that God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that God will abandon us. The test is not our perfection. The test is our abiding trust in Yeshua, our Savior. Yet it is God's will that we be obedient to Him. It is God's will that we follow the pure ways and not do as Jephthah and so many others did and pervert God's word with man's word. We have a guide. We have a helper to accomplish God's will. That guide is the is Holy Scripture. The helper is the Holy Spirit. Let us pray that the Lord will give us the strength and desire to rid ourselves of man-made celebrations, doctrinal pronouncements that are familiar and comfortable but have no basis in truth and ought to have no place in our lives as followers of the God of Israel. Let us pray that the wonderful things that the Lord has planned for our lives are carried out as Jesus would carry them out as opposed to how Jephthah would carry them out. We'll start chapter 12 next week.